So today's guest is Valerie Fields. Valerie, who also goes by VK, is that right? That's right. Okay. Studied journalism and mass communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which we are all very familiar with in this area, but her education didn't stop there. She also earned multiple degrees, including her PhD in theology. She's done public relations for a lot of big time clients. She has her own firm called PR Pros. She also pays it forward. She's been teaching PR and crisis communications at her alma mater, UNC, for 18 years. In 2023, she was honored with the Power 100 Award as one of the top most influential business leaders in the state. Valerie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation. Well, I appreciate you making time for me. And um, your bio is so impressive. But you know, what I always want to share with people is the story behind the bio because success doesn't happen overnight. We right. didn't just all get here because we worked hard in one job and that led to where we are. Um, you know, there's just so many things along the way. And I think those things are what really inform people in terms of how to avoid things and how to deal with obstacles. So let's back up and start with your education because you've had a lot of education. <laughs> so talk about, you know, where you grew up and, and, and your beginning stages of your education. I think of myself as a lifelong learner. So every opportunity I got to advance education, I took it. Uh, I actually grew up in Raleigh. I think there's maybe originally four of us. <laughs> there are here. not many people who are original Raleigh natives, right. that is for sure. Raleigh is home for me, and that includes, uh, I went to daycare on Six Forks Road. I attended Douglas Elementary School, Carroll Middle School, Sanderson High so School. So you are, you're the OG Raleigh. <laughs> That's it, and I lived in what was then North Raleigh, grew up there. That is now the middle of the city. Absolutely. Um, by North Hills Mall. Okay, okay. And um, my father, who is 97, still lives there in the house that I grew up in, and it is amazing to see how that area has transformed. Just blossomed, yeah. Absolutely. It's a completely different place. But uh, the, the journey was really about uh, pursuing my natural skills, gifts, talents. I knew I wanted to write in some format or another. And what going to Carolina did was allowed me to major in journalism and mass communication and then specialize in public relations. And public relations really has been my entire career path and just using the different tools and platforms that have evolved over time. But the degrees in theology, I grew up in just a wonderful Christian-based home. And as I got older, as most young adults do, you do basically growing up what your parents tell you to do. You follow the examples that you see around sure. you. Sure, which is good in some cases and right. not always good. Not just always depends. good. <laughs> For me, it was really good, but I wanted to know why do I believe what I believe? And the way to do that was just to study to study what I had grown up and was familiar with, but to also study other things that were out there to make sure I was making an informed decision. And that just one door opened and it led to multiple other doors. And it also opened the door for me to do mission work. And that allowed me to partner with an organization and attend a mission trip with them and then go back on my own independently, serving youth and families in Eastern Africa in the nation of Uganda. And that was just a transformational, uh, transformational experience for me. And it was wonderful. And it really changed how I see the world. I got to tell you, Amanda, it changed how I see life and, and helped me prioritize in a way that I never had before the things that really matter. What I saw when I was there was what real problems look like. And that's not a lot of traffic on I-40. It's not bureaucracy and red tape. Those, those are issues that we deal with. First world but, problems, right? right? They, re they really are. I mean, you, it puts privilege in a whole new category. When I realized that the car that I was driving was bigger than some people's homes, I decided that from that moment on, I would not have a really bad day after that. And I haven't. It, it just allowed me to put things in perspective because I was spending time at an orphanage and I shared a room with five little girls and they woke up singing every mm. morning, just up singing. They own one set of clothes for school and maybe one set of play clothes. I donated some of my clothing. And I remember one day I saw this little girl walk by in wearing what I would call pajamas that I had donated. 
And I was getting ready to say something to her like, oh, no, no, you those don't are wear pajamas. those. Those are pajamas. And I thought, how ridiculous does that sound? These are clothes that we only wear at night or these are clothes that we only wear on a Sunday. For her, it didn't or matter. It did not matter. They were new. They were pretty and pink and frilly. And she was wearing them in the middle of the day proudly. And it just gave me a new perspective on gratitude and, and just what what should be important in our lives. But the background of that theology training was really helping me understand how I could be of more service in the world. Um, so were you at an orphanage outside of Kampala by any chance? Yes. About an hour outside a very large orphanage yes. and it's run by an organization out of Texas? I'm not sure if... Uh, a Christian organization. But yes. So I went to that orphanage. Wow. This is a crazy coincidence. <laughs> That's because a crazy I, very, I did not know this about your about your background. I went with a medical mission trip from Duke. Okay. And they were doing free brain surgery wow. for people from all over the continent. And this was uh, brain surgery on tumors that were not malignant but had gone very okay. far to take people's abilities down, you know, their right. mental abilities, their physical abilities. And so one day we did a field trip to this orphanage and same thing. The kids were all singing and skipping and playing. And the doctors on this trip had adopted several of the kids there and were helping pay for their schooling and their That's clothing wonderful. and then eventually their college. So um, it was, I would agree with you, it was transformative for me too. Right. So it's just to hear you say those words. Unreal that we have that It's a pretty crazy <laughs> connection. So how long ago was this trip? This was 2009. Okay, so I was there in 2017. Okay. But it does sound like it informed you. And I think one of the important things for all of us when we have those experiences is to hold on to them. Absolutely. So how have you held on to it and, and been able to incorporate that experience, but also your theology background in everything you do? I think the lessons learned there just became ingrained in how I saw the world from that point forward. And then when I find myself self facing a challenge, I really am intentional about putting it in perspective. Is this really a problem? Is this really something to be upset about, something to lose sleep over? And is this whatever is facing me, will I remember it a month from now, a year from now? How, how much of my attention should this issue get when I've seen what real problems are? And is my time better served elsewhere based on what I know the needs are in the world? I would say those were the, the lifelong lessons that I brought with me after that work over there. That's amazing. So you own your own business. So tell yes. me about PR pros and tell me about the obstacles because we all know there are obstacles in being a business owner. Definitely. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. That, that I think we all have learned. I started my company. Uh, this is year number 27. And we had an amazing, beautiful celebration for our 25th anniversary. And just to look back over the years and think, wow, at that time, I've been doing this 25 years. And I decided that the first decade was the hardest. <laughs> it's been an amazing journey. Uh, PR Pros, we are a full service public relations agency. We're a small shop boutique agency, fewer than 10 employees, is defined as a boutique for those who aren't familiar with that term. We actually renovated a building in the historic Prince Hall District in downtown Raleigh on Blunt Street in 2009 going into 2020. And we finished the renovation, got the, the last furniture in, and then the pandemic hit, the governor's orders, and you basically everybody go home. Oh. So we finished this amazing renovation and then had to move out. Oh, no. <laughs> But I was so glad that it was done because who knew how disruptive that would be right. uh, at the beginning. But uh, we're, we're there. Initially, we were uh, previously on Hargett Street here in downtown Raleigh and then moved to the building on Blunt Street about probably a half a mile away. And we're basically storytellers and content creators. 
My background is public relations. My first PR job was as a publicist at Walt Disney World down in Florida. Oh, that sounds fun. It was amazing. I mean, that really built the foundation for me loving this work because Disney then and probably now are, were, and will continue to be the masters of storytelling. And so I learned I learned PR in practice at Walt Disney World, and that, that was phenomenal and a, an amazing springboard into owning my own company. And we started just freelancing 27 years ago with small clients, small projects. I wrote for the News and Observer. I wrote for an ad agency in Durham and just basically said, wherever there's an opportunity, I will pursue it. And then I started working on a project called Bridge Builders, and the, the speaker connected to that project was Les Brown, the motivational speaker. And just the opportunity to be exposed to a project and work at that level. And then I started doing some work with the city of Atlanta. And the clients were getting bigger than me just being a freelancer. And so I basically hung out my shingle and said, I think, I think this is it. It's time to do it on it's your own. Time. Yeah. And I thought I was going back. You ask about the obstacles. I, I left Ch uh, Ch um, UNC Chapel Hill to go work at Disney. And then I had to reapply and get accepted back into Carolina to finish my degree. But Disney was so amazing. I just absolutely knew this is where I'm going to spend my career. I was sold. And I was applying. And for the first time, and then the economy went into recession. And for the first time in the history of Disney's uh, existence, they went into a hiring freeze mode. And so you couldn't get your job and back. And I could not get the job. And I watched my hopes and dreams crumble right before my eyes because that was the plan for me. That was it. It was everything because you could do so many things at Disney. I was there when The Lion King was being developed, which is now celebrated its 25th and anniversary so, years And so just so much there, so much material, right. so much content. Isn't it funny, though, how we have these moments in life that we think are going to be so defining? Right. You know, oh my gosh, this happened, and so I went a different path, and what if? But, you know, then you look back and think, okay, well, I wouldn't be where I am today Absolutely. if that hadn't have happened. And you, you learn from the challenges and the obstacles. So my dreams are shattered. I don't know what I'm going to do. Nobody's hiring. I sent out, and this is before you could just upload a resume or have online services that distribute your resume for you. I must have sent out 75 job applications and Ghosting wasn't a term then, but that's what people did. That's, that's what was happening. <laughs> Nobody was, was happening. calling you back. You know what? I think that's happening a lot now, too, online platforms. It, it is. There's not a lot of response. There's not a lot of response. 75 with zero responses. Not even the rejection letters. At least Not even like the standard right, form. Nothing, right. Nothing. And so basically out of necessity, I couldn't find a job. So I created one. You, ma you, you manifested your destiny. Yes, I did. What do, you, what do you think um, the specific obstacles that women face in owning businesses are? Wow, let's see. Just at that time, and I don't know that it's significantly different now, just not being taken seriously. All of the stereotypes about what a woman's role ought to be. And then add to that for me, being an African-American woman, I can remember having conversations with bankers to, trying to find opportunities to capitalize the company and just basically being dismissed and ignored. I actually started going by VK Fields because just seeing the name Valerie seemed to, to be a, a prejudice or bias against me as a woman before I even got in the door. That is so interesting because, you know, there's also connections with names that are more ethnic where people are concerned that they're not going to be hired because of sure. their color of their skin or their cultural background. Absolutely. And even people that have names that could be either gender 
you know, they might even be in a better situation because somebody doesn't know if Pat or Kelly right. is a man or a woman. But that's really interesting. That's where the VK came from. Well, that, that makes sense. I mean, it, among other things, so you do everything that you can to set yourself up for success. But uh, I started my company very young, so there was that, that you don't know anything yet. You don't have any experience. And the, and the phrase I kept hearing was, you have to pay your dues. You have to pay your dues. And I was like, yeah, I paid my dues. I paid so many dues. I know. I'm starting this company at my age, in my 50s, and I'm like, wait a minute. There was 35 years of dues. Why? I've already paid. I've already and paid, some. and now I have to pay more. <laughs> so there was a lot of the pay your dues. You're too young. And then I, I just kept at it and just a supportive uh, family, supportive friends, and a great work ethic that I certainly learned from my parents. And then I started to make a little money, not enough, but a, a, a little. little started coming in and that that's right. kind that's of the encouragement that right. you need. And I worked second shift, I've worked third shift, I've worked two jobs I to make it happen. I've had individuals who you would think would be supportive when I was really struggling and it was just really bad and hard say just just throw in the towel you don't have anything you need to prove and then you can just go work for x person or that person or why are you pursuing this dream why don't you come help me fulfill my dream I thought well my dream is just as valid as your dream is and so I think I'm going to stick with this and I did, and now we're celebrating 27 years at just sticking to it, and I'm grateful for that. But I appreciate the naysayers or the doubters because it makes you do some self-reflection. Am I doing this because this is what I'm supposed to be doing, or am I trying to prove something to someone else or to myself? And my father, who just has been my biggest cheerleader throughout the years, I remember him when I was really struggling uh, and the company was really young, he said, if this is what you believe you're supposed to be doing, then I support you 100%, and I'm here to help you. That's such a gift. Yes, and that's the boost that I needed, that I have a safety net where if it doesn't work out, I can just try again. And that's an amazing emotional boost and lift. And something I hope I can offer to other young entrepreneurs that sometimes you just need a cheerleader, you just need someone to say, I believe in you. But I've got to tell you one of the, the most defining moments, I think the company is now probably in its, you know, at least 10 years old. And we're looking at uh, the September 11th attacks and the world, certainly the nation, but the world is just transfixed by those moments and immediately the next day clients just started calling one by one canceling contracts saying they couldn't move forward everybody is devastated we don't know what to do amanda we lost 25 out of 25 clients that we had within the span of a week and i remember meeting with my team we had an office in north raleigh at the time and i said i can I'm not sure that I can keep the doors open. We've just lost all of our clients. And honestly, I can't be upset about it because so many people lost so much more. We're talking clients and money and we can remake and rebuild that. But people have lost loved ones and they've lost friends and family. And I, there's no comparison. But I want to be honest with you all that we're in dire straits here and I just don't know what to do. And sitting around the conference table in our office, my team said to me, Valerie, we believe in you. If you have to close this office because you can't afford the rent, if you have to shut it down, you can forward the office phones to our homes. We will work from home until you figure out how to pull it back together. That's amazing. And I tell you what, when people believe in you like that, you find, you dig deep and you find something somewhere in you that says, I can't let them down because maybe in this moment they see something in me that I don't see, but I'm going to believe in that. And a good friend of mine told me one time, sometimes you just need someone else to have enough faith in you until you can have that kind of faith in yourself. And we, we stayed open. 
we just dug deep and kept going. And I think probably five years after that, we won the small business pinnacle, uh, small business of the year pinnacle award from the chamber of commerce for just perseverance and, and hanging in there. And I got the credit and my picture was taken, but it all, all the credit probably goes to my team for just believing that we could pull it off. And we did. And so we're here 27 years now. What a great story. I mean, you. and again, you've just described everything that we talked about in the beginning, which is that nothing is easy, right? You know, right. you're picking your hard path. It's right. always going to be a hard path to, to be successful by any measure, you know, whether it's money or number of clients or right. you know, things like that. So what we talk about a lot on this podcast is, is, the ability to transform, mm -hmm. the ability to pivot, the ability to change. And specifically, it seems to be harder for women over a certain age if they've lost a job, left a job, that they don't really feel necessarily as relevant right. as they used to feel. They don't necessarily feel seen. And they're not sure that they have another chapter, even though they have wisdom and they have a great work ethic and they have life experience. What kind of advice would you give to women who are feeling that way? I would say we don't owe explanations to others about our worth. We have to define that. I think historically we've just been undervalued because there were so many opportunities that were not available. And even as the opportunities changed, and laws changed, that policies changed. I'm not sure mindsets did. But, I mean, at some point, you have, to, you have to understand and embrace the fact that you are enough. And when people challenge your resume, well, what about this gap here? We have to, to help people understand and maybe educate people on the value of work, whether that work is within a home or outside of a home. I mean, some of the most talented people maybe never spent time in a conference room or a boardroom, but they have the creativity, they have the organization skills, they have the talent, the time management, the wisdom, the background, the education, and all they need is the access and the opportunity. And women often, we do each other a disservice by not rallying together and combining our strengths and our collective wisdom to be cheerleaders and supporters and mentors of each other. I think we could do a better job of reaching out and supporting each other because we understand what that path is. We understand what it is to be undervalued or underestimated when we are well qualified. For, for several years, three terms, I was president of the Women's Forum of North Carolina. And there was a phrase that we often reference is that you rarely find a man who says it's, he's unqualified for something. Even if he is, clearly. You know, <laughs> that, because he's make, he, what is it, fake it till you make it, right? right? And I think women often do the opposite. We were talking a lot about women running for office, and so many declined the invita invitation to do so because they're afraid of losing or concerned that uh, it might be a disruption or they won't be taken seriously or they don't have the network or they don't have the money or whatever it might be. And you just don't hear men default to that response. That's and, very true. <laughs> that is so true. So we could take a we could take a lesson from their playbook and just go in with the confidence that I can figure it out. Because that's what everyone else is doing. I can figure it out. I and we should just go for it. One of the speeches that I do, um, I hand out mirrors and I ask women to look in the mirror and talk about what they see. And most of us see our faults, right? You know, you see gray hair or you see wrinkles or, you know, maybe your face is a little bit asymmetrical. And I said, what do you think a man sees when he looks in the mirror? <laughs> he says, I look good, good. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so I think that's kind of a shorthand to what you're talking about, which right. is this cultural and societal mindset that we still have in 2024, which right. is so unbelievable. So you have done a lot in your life already. You're, you're still young in the 50 plus club. I'm going <laughs> to say that you. you're a junior, you're a junior, you're 51. My um, early 50. You're, the, you're, you're just <laughs> entering this season of life. But you, um, you know, I'm sure there's more you want to do. What's in your bucket list? 
Oh, wow. Well, I got to tell you, I just finished writing a PR, public relations writing textbook. Of course you did. And <laughs> in your spare time, right? In my spare time. And that feeling is amazing. That's been on my list for probably 10 years. And a publishing company reached out to me during the pandemic. I actually almost deleted the email because I thought it was a joke. Right, right. And, and I was like, oh, they are serious. This is amazing. Oh. And so I've spent the uh, past several years working on that. And it will be ready for the fall semester. That was a big one to check off my Absolutely. list. Absolutely. Congratulations Thank on that. You. Finishing a book is a huge accomplishment. Yes, yes. So I'm certainly thrilled about that. And I'm looking at expanding within the company my role in crisis communication. I am seeing that there's a greater need for people understanding how to respond when things go badly. And the, the n number of social media outlets and platforms just giving more people more places to say horrible things to each other and make more mistakes. And in, in our line of work, we're seeing that brands are a little bit wary of what to say and what to do. And how to do when, it. And yeah. how to do it, right. So I'm looking at the opportunities in crisis communication because that's an area that I specialize in also. Yeah, I, as a retired journalist, I can tell you, you know when you play the other side of a fight, when you're having right. an argument with somebody, I do that at press conferences. Right. I'll say, oh, no, 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 no. Why did you say that? Right. Why didn't you say this? <laughs> and I think that's what crisis communications is. I'm like, no, no, no. That's not how you respond. That's right. not going to work, you know. Um, so I would agree with you. That's a big area, especially with the proliferation of the online stuff. Definitely. Valerie, how can people find you online and follow you? Absolutely. Our website is globalprpros.com. And for anybody who's in downtown going down Blunt Street, we're the Carolina Blue Building on your left. Okay. <laughs> that has okay. my name on it. And I'll put all your links in in the show notes yes. when the show airs so people can see that. That'd be great. And I got to tell you, this has been such a delight. You know, every time I have a new guest, I do sometimes know them and then sometimes I don't. You were referred to me. And um, wow, I just feel really lucky to have had this conversation today. The whole time I'm thinking, oh, that's a really good nugget. That's a good takeaway. So I've learned a lot from you, thank you. And I think my audience will too. So thank you for sharing your time and talent with us. My pleasure. I appreciate the invitation.